So we are speaking with Maxim Furek, who is an avid student of the paranormal. His eclectic background includes aspects of psychology, addictions, and rock journalism. Uh, he has a master's degree in communications from Bloomsburg University and a bachelor's degree in psychology from Aquinas College. He has been interviewed on numerous podcasts, including Exploring the Bizarre with the legendary Timothy Green Beckley, a.k.a. Mr. UFO, and Tim R. Swartz, uh, a.k.a. Commander X. Uh, his book, Shepton, The Myth, Miracle, and Music, was featured on Australia's Mysterious Universe. Maxim is a contributor to Fate Magazine, my site, Normal Paranormal, and The Paranormal Underground. But today, Maxim will be discussing his unexpected journey into the paranormal universe that included the Shepton mythology, as well as his new book, Coal Region Hoodoo, Paranormal Tales from Inside the Pit, which has just been released. Where can we get a copy of your book? Well, Justin, thanks. Uh, first of all, thanks you uh, for having me on your show, your podcast, and uh, uh, for this opportunity to talk to your listeners. But yeah, um, Coal Region Hoodoo, Paranormal Tales from uh, Inside the Pit, just uh, was published, uh, just came out. Uh, by uh, Beyond the Fray Publishing House uh, out of San Diego, and it was just released on Amazon last week, so uh, uh, viewers can purchase a copy of Coal Region Hoodoo and uh, uh, the Shepton Mythology on uh, Amazon.com. So, you know, check it out. You could, they could at, very, at the very least just read about it and see if that's something that they might be interested in. But uh, most people that hear about Shepton, they just think it's just like a most amazing... Uh, you know, uh, narrative of, of the paranormal. Yeah. And that's, you know, it, it's interesting because, you know, you, you build yourself as a rock journalist and then a paranormal researcher, right? And that's quite a, quite a shift, you know, how did you, I mean, how did this shift happen? You know, when you were writing about some of your earlier books to well, this, it's going it's, it's to get crazier. You know, I mean, uh, first of all, we're allowed to wear as many hats as we, as we want to. So I've always been a rock journalist. And, uh, what I do is I take a look at the culture of rock and roll through, uh, I guess I would call it a sociological lens, trying to make some sense of it. You know, and I always felt that music was transformative uh, you know, and it's so important for the civil rights movement and the anti-Vietnam uh, movement and women's rights and all that. And songs like We Shall Overcome and Blowing in the Wind and, you know, just so many others rally people. And uh, so, uh, you know, music has always been a very important part of me. And I've been a rock journalist. I've had numerous books uh, published uh, about music. Uh, my uh, previous book, uh, Somebody Else's Dream, the uh, Dakota, the Boys, and Timothy, celebrated uh, the anniversary of the song Timothy, which uh, seemed to parallel the Shefton mining disaster. So uh, my mm -hmm. books sort of play against one another. But uh, how did I go from being a, a rock journalist to a paranormal author? And what happened was I was writing this book called Somebody Else's Dream. I was just writing something about a rock mythology, the connection between the song Timothy from 1971 and the Shepton mining disaster of 1963. Uh, the song was about cannibalism in a mine shaft. And in 63, when three miners were entombed for two weeks, only, only two came out and people wanted to know what happened to the third miner. And back then in 63, and even today, there are voices that said that cannibalism took place. So the song Timothy from 71 is about uh, the Shepton mining, mining disaster. What happened was, as I was re researching this rock mythology, I realized that there were other elements, other aspects of uh, high strangement, high strangeness, a term that you taught me. And, uh, but, um, uh, for example, out of body experiences, near death experiences, and after life experiences, just for starters. So Shepton is quite bizarre and uh, quite the example of, uh, uh, of high strangeness. Yeah, it, it's really bizarre, you know, this whole aspect of high strangeness. Uh, do you feel that sometimes you're kind of being guided on a path to write about certain things? Or do you think you're truly choosing these topics? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. That's a great question. I mean, with 
the Shepton mythology, I just stumbled into it. You know, I was a rock journalist writing about rock and roll. I was writing about uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the roots, you know, the genesis of the song Timothy. And, uh, you know, Rupert Holmes, when he wrote it, was wanted to write a controversial song. So he wrote a song about cannibalism in a mine shaft. That's what it was. And when people looked at it and listened to it, it seemed to parallel what happened in Shepton. And as I in, explored Shepton, I saw all of these things, you know, humanoid creatures and apparitions and, you know, uh, uh, examples of life after death and just all kinds of strange things. And uh, for your viewers who, 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 I'm sure that your viewers are a lot more knowledgeable about a lot of this paranormal, uh, you, you know, uh, you know um, philosophies than, than I am, but uh, it was Dr. J. Allen Hynek who, uh, back in 72, he wrote a book called The UFO Experience, and he talked about strangers, and we're talking about paranormal uh, elements, and if it had a high strangeness that had a whole lot of levels of this par uh, of, uh, the paranormal, and Shepton certainly fits into that. I mean, I wanted to call this book The Shepton Convergence because of that convergence of paranormal themes that happen at the same place, basically at the same time. But, uh, you know, Hynek already had that covered with his term, uh, High Strangeness. And, and also, for, for your viewers uh, who have seen Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Uh, the, the person in Close Encounters was based on Alan Hynek, and uh, he was the one who said that we have three uh, elements of uh, Close Encounters, and the third one is when we actually see uh, alien life forms, actually meet them. So he was an important uh, individual in ufology, and also he was important as far as us, as giving us terminology to help us make sense of what we see and what we talk about. And even today, I mean, you and I and this podcast, I mean, we owe a lot to Alan uh, Hynek for, for his contributions to ufology and to the paranormal. Yeah, and it's interesting because Hynek started out uh, investigating UFOs for the government as part of Project Blue Book. And, but he was a very scientific guy, right? And he started to, at the, in the very beginning, just debunking a lot of these. Exactly. exactly. I mean, go figure. Yeah. And then <laughs> he became, there, you know? right. He, he became a transformation. Believer. He came around. Yeah. And, and when you first began your journey into this, you know, subject matter, uh, did, were you a skeptic? Were you kind of like on the fence about a lot of this stuff or? I was, you know, first of all, the one thing that uh, spoke to me were the passion of people such as yourself who uh, are really uh, immersed in this and this, uh, you know, the, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the aspects of the occult, you know, these, these mysteries, unexplainable mysteries. And so like that passion just was something that spoke to me. The other thing that I wanted to find out, so I read a whole lot of books about UFOs. I was a, uh, an avid student of Roswell. I read everything I could get about Roswell, the Philadelphia Experiment. I mean, so many different things. Trying to find a academic pathway to the truth. And so that's pretty much what I do and what I've done. You know, I consider myself an academic, uh, you, know, uh, you, you know, trying to, to find uh, out, you know, trying to put uh, names and labels onto these things that we're looking at, you know, putting them into genres and all of that helps us to figure it out in the end. But um, I don't know. I, I don't know if I'm a true believer, but I mean, like I have a lot of passion for the field and I want to learn more and whether it's Bigfoot or UFOs, miracles, apparitions, you know, whatever. I mean, it's, and, you know, because we're talking about a, a, a whole plethora of things and they're all exciting and they're all fascinating. And as human beings, it's our job to go and search for meaning. And that's what we're doing tonight on, on a show such as yours. Yeah. And, you know, your, your background, what I find really interesting is, you know, your, your career, you know, in the beginning was in psychology, right? right. I mean, um, so how has that background really helped you to better understand, you know, these various phenomena? Well, I, I, if anything, it's made me even more curious. I mean, I don't know if uh, having a background in psychology has given me any, any answers, but, um, you know, uh, when I wrote Cole Region Hoodoo, I quote from Jung and uh, Carl Jung and Freud. And, uh, you know, I go into, I, go, I travel deep into the psychological uh, 
tenets and philosophy. So uh, uh, co-region hoodoo is different. I mean, certainly it's about the par paranormal, but I take a, a different look and I, I use a different aspect. I have a different perspective in looking at this. So, um, uh, you know, I just can't wait until there's more reviews on Amazon just to see what the readers have to say about it because the first one by my friend poet John Yamros was he's a friend and so you know he wrote a, wrote a glowing uh, review of the book which I think was heartfelt but um, you know I, I uh, need, to, need to get a few more from people that don't know me but they know the book so um, um, I, I don't know I mean I really can't answer your question how did my background in psychology help me I mean um, you know it gave me some tools but uh, I could have been a bricklayer, I could have been a painter, I could have been a rock star, a rock musician, and, and brought those tools to, to this forum and used those. So, you know, everything we have, I mean, we're all individual and, you know, um, you know and we're trying to figure out this together. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, the, 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 the realm of the paranormal is just uh, fascinating and wondrous and just, uh, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's there for us to to discover what now so for for those of um our listeners and our audience who who is familiar with your work and who may have read shepton would you say that coal region hoodoo is an extension of that or a sequel to that or is it like a completely different experience altogether because you, you include a lot of other things in in coal region hoodoo I'd say it's two out of those three that you just mentioned. It's it's an extension of Shepton because uh, after I wrote Shepton, the outpouring and the uh, support from the paranormal community was just uh, just amazing, uh, you know. And back in 2018, I mean, there was a relaunch. I mean, the the book did really well when it came out in uh, 2016. But what I did was I wrote an, an article for Fate magazine. And because and that was in 2018. Because of that, I was invited, as you were, to the Fort Fest in Baltimore, where, where, where we presented, and I talked about the Shepton mythology. And because of that, uh, Mysterious uh, Universe, uh, the podcast from Australia, heard about me, and they did a 90-minute segment on Maxim W. Furick and the Shepton mythology, which was really kind of cool. I mean, to hear uh, two guys with Australian accents paraphrase, you know, and read through my book was just pretty awesome. So that was the, uh, it was Fate Magazine. It was the uh, Fort Fest in Baltimore. It was uh, Australia's um, Mysterious Universe. And then the fourth thing, it was actually four wonderful things that happened in 2018, 2019. And that was uh, the Skeptical Inquirer. And they did an article about Shepton. And the first part of the, and it was really extensive, but they raved about it and said that the uh, Shepton mythology was the, uh, uh, you know, the quintess the defin definitive book about the topic. And then at the end, what they did was they had to debunk it and say that um, they, you, they referenced Occam's razor. And the, the way I understand it, Occam's razor is a very archaic means of, um, I guess, argumentation. And when something is very complex, you know, something with high strangeness, if something is complex what you, and convoluted, uh, what you do then is you pick the uh, argument that is the most basic and simplest. And in the case of the Shefton miners, that would have been hallucinations. So you just write off the whole Shefton mythology, the out-of-body experience, the near-death experience, the life-after-death experience, write that, those all off as hallucinations. And that's what they did in uh, this um, skeptical inquiry. I disagree because we're talking about something that is not simplistic and basic. It is very convoluted. It's complex. We don't know. You know, it's beyond the scientific realm. So uh, I'm glad that they wrote about it. You know, they gave the Shepton mythology even more notoriety, but I think that they were wrong. And, uh, you know, just try to just for the sake of trying to debunk something that they couldn't explain in scientific terms. So, Well, now with this book, Coal Region Hoodoo, are you confident about how your audience will accept it? Well, based on how enthused they were uh, with the Shepton uh, mythology, yeah, I really am. Uh, you know, we were doing a presentation in 
at the Schoolkill Historical Society in Pottsville. And some woman came up to me and she shook my hand and she said, I read your book three times. Now, I don't know why she read it three times, but she must have liked it. There must have been something there that she liked. But um, no, we've had a really good uh, response for the book. And I just decided that I wanted to go in that direction. So uh, Co-Region Hoodoo is an ex extension of the Shepton mythology. And certainly I talk about uh, Shepton, but I also talk uh, more extensively about Pope John the 23rd. And, uh, and, and we blend, uh, we blend the, the, the uh, uh, paranormal with the spiritual, which is, which is some, something that I think uh, I don't think has been done before. But, you know, I mean, when we talk about guardian angels and apparitions and, uh, and uh, miracles, you know, we're talking about something I think of the paranormal. I think that, you know, I call it uh, Roman Catholic mysticism, but uh, it's just as uh, mysterious, uh, you know, uh, as, as anything else that, that you'll be talking about on your podcast. So uh, it's an ex uh, cool way region who, who do is, yes, is an extension of the Shepton mythology, but it goes further and has a wider scope. It goes, it goes deeper. Gotcha. And, you know, you mentioned that your book has, you know, this unique blend of the spiritual and the supernatural. I mean, why is that? Well, because that's just the way it is. Uh, I talk about, uh, for, for an example, um, you know, um, Pope Francis uh, is currently hospitalized. That's in the news right now. Uh, it was Pope Francis that had a dual canonization in 2014 in the Vatican. Uh, typically, uh, with a, uh, when you uh, when a, uh, a pope is made a saint, it's only one person, and they have to demonstrate two miracles. And uh, in this case, uh, Pope Francis. Uh, chose two individuals. One was Pope John the 23rd, who plays a key role in the Shepton mythology. The miners believe that he, his, he was there in the mine with them for two weeks and that he saved their lives. Vatican scholars cited Shepton as one of Pope John's uh, the, the 23rd's miracles. The second uh, pope that was canonized was uh, Pope John Paul II. He was an exorcist. And what he did was he convened a school of exorcism, and he had all of these priests from around the world come there to learn how to go and do the uh, pro, uh, perform the rite of exorcism. Uh, when we talk about that, we talk about you know good and evil. We talk about the power of the devil, and I believe that evil does exist. I believe the devil exists, and the devil wants us to think that he or she is just a cartoon, a non-entity, but. Uh, you know, but I believe that, um, you know, uh, God's power is stronger than that of the devil. And, uh, you know, uh, I know when I had interviewed Ed and Lorraine Warren, the demonologist, I mean, this was uh, exactly, you know, what they were talking about and, uh, you know, uh, what they used when they went into battle. Yeah. And, and that was one of the really interesting things that, that you've done um, is you spoke directly with Ed and Lorraine Warren. You even yeah, photographed yeah. them. I know, and, yeah. And, yeah, I mean, and, and you actually wrote an article up on uh, normalparanormal.org publishing some of these photographs that had never been released. Yeah. And, um, you know, tell me a little bit about that, you know, because that's in the book, right? Like your experiences yeah. with them. Yeah, and uh, they were great people. You know, they both passed away. Ed and Lorraine Warren, they were from Connecticut. They were uh, Roman Catholic demonologists, and they were involved in the Amityville Horror and a whole bunch of other haunted uh places, the one in uh, Enfield, I believe, in uh, North London, uh, they went over there. Uh, all of the Conjuring movies, Conjuring 1, Conjuring 2, uh, Annabelle, uh, all of those uh, motion pictures were based on Ed and Lorraine Warren, and their franchise is the second most successful horror franchise after Godzilla. So, I mean, there's a little quotable quote, but they were in Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania in uh, 1988. They were uh, kicking off, they were initiating a 15-city tour to promote the book, The, the Haunted. And that was about the Schmurl haunted, haunting in uh, West Pittston, Pennsylvania. So I went there. I had written a letter to the, uh, the owner of the uh, Victorian Theater, and I requested uh, a, an opportunity to photograph them and interview them. So he set that up, and I took pictures. I listened to their... Uh, their program. I remember it, well, I think it was in July and it was hotter than anything. And they were inside the old theater doing a, uh, 
PowerPoint presentation and they had fans going and it was really, it was like torture, but it was really hot. But afterwards we went outside and we hung out and I took pictures and they were just nice to, to chat with and to converse with, uh, very unassuming. And then over the years I would call them up. I was doing some research on the Shmuro haunting and I would call them up and Lorraine had a pet rooster and uh, that would be there. You could hear the rooster in the background in her home in Connecticut. And, um, you know, again, they were just like really nice people. They treated me well, treated me with respect. And they would talk about what they did when they uh, would go into these uh, houses that, uh, that uh, people believed were possessed with de demonic uh, spirits. So uh, that, yeah, and I did uh, include a couple of their pictures in Coal Region Hoodoo, and there is a chapter on them, which, which they deserve it. Yeah, like, is there anything that you could talk about like some of the subjects that you guys had spoken about on, on the phone. Cause I know you had mentioned that you kept in touch with Lorraine for, for a number of years. Um, you know, again, I'm sure there's a lot of private conversations, but is there anything that may be, uh, might be able to help those who, uh, who, who follow them and who, who admire them? Like anything, any insights that you could share with us? Well, what you just, from them. just some basic things for, for the novice uh, person who's getting involved in uh, the paranormal. You know, uh, I would really be careful of uh, things like Ouija boards, tarot cards, seances, fortune tellers. You know, I would sort of stay away from that. I mean, that's getting too close to the flame. Uh, you know, they could be portals to, uh, to dark places, evil places. And, uh, you know, and so I would I would just encourage people not to not to go there. Um, Ed and Lorraine uh, Warren also believe that evil exists. Uh, it could be uh, in the form of demonic uh, spirits, you know, who, uh, you know, and demonic possession. And they would go into places like Amityville and, uh, you know, order the demon to show that show the, themselves. And they would use holy water and the crucifix. Uh, they uh, Ed Warren would. Uh, invoke the spirit of Padre Pio and Jesus Christ and St. Michael the Archangel to do battle with these spirits. And uh, so he would uh, uh, poison himself and do that. But, um, you know, um, scary stuff. Uh, you know, some people uh, have never come back from from this. And it's not a lark. It's not just a, a hobby or a, a light pastime. And this is serious business. And again, uh, I would warn your your listeners not to get too close to the flame because you know bad things could happen. Bad things have happened with with possession, and uh, you know. So um, again, that's that's my personal viewpoint, but that was also reflected by priests that I've, that I've spoken with, uh, and also uh, Ed and Lorraine Warren told me the same thing. So uh, just be careful. You know, it's one thing to talk about it and to read about it, but uh, to actually experience it may not be such a good idea. Now, when you're diving into a lot of these rather dangerous topics at times, has anything strange happened to you? Like, have you gotten too close to the, to the flame, so to speak, while just simply researching it? Yeah, I, I have, and, uh, and I won't do that again. I mean, I've participated in uh, the things that I, that I said uh, people shouldn't, you know, Ouija boards, tarot cards, seances, I mean, crazy stuff. You know, a lot of this as a college student, but uh, I won't do that again. I mean, I was, uh, you know, on several occasions really terrified by some things that happened. And I don't need to discuss what they are because, you know, you know, what was terrifying for me may not be, you know, that horrifying, you know, for you. But uh, but it was something that really spoke to me and scared me. And I won't go there again. Won't do that again. But I do warn people about that. By the same token, you know, uh, wonderful spiritual things that, that have happened to me, you know, uh, I don't discuss either because those, I think, are of a personal uh, sacred nature, you know, between me and my higher power. And I don't need to go and talk about that for notoriety, you know, for my credibility, for my resume, for any of that. And I refuse to do that. I mean, what... Uh, may have happened to me is something that's just, again is, is of a personal nature, and uh, I won't discuss the good stuff, but I will <laughs> warn people about the bad stuff. You know, stay away. It's it's real, and uh, you know, uh, evil exists in many many different forms. So yeah, it really does, and you know, I think that aspect is certainly underestimated by 
people who are interested in this subject, who investigate it, who read about it. Um, but at the same token, those experiences that do take place with people, they're very personal, like you, like you touched on, right? Like it's, there's a lot that happens to people every day. And most of those people do not share those experiences because they are so personal. Um, and, and it leads me to believe that the paranormal happens again, it's just my take on it. The paranormal happens and it's catered to that individual experiencer. And, um, other people could play a role into the experience. Sure. But it seems like it needs the experiencer just as much as it needs to create the experience itself. If that makes any sense. Um, when you were, uh, growing up before you got into any of this stuff? I mean, you mentioned the college experiences, but had you had any other just unexplainable things take place in your life that kind of, that have stood out to you as interesting that you can talk about? You know, I wish I did. I wish I, I had something that I could just present to, to your uh, listeners, you know, uh, but I really haven't. I, I approach, uh, uh, the paranormal uh, as an academic, you know, as a, uh, I used to call myself a paranormal researcher. And then I realized that that's a bit pre uh, presumptuous. I mean, I'm not a researcher. I don't go into haunted houses and look for demons or ghosts or spooks or any of that. I write about it. You know, I write about it as an academic. I study it. I talk to other people such as yourself about it. And, uh, you know, I really have a, a passionate interest in it. But, um, but no, um, my upbringing, my resume as a uh, as a teenager and you know, and, and as an adolescent, you know, where all of the things that a lot of us baby boomers were raised on, whether it was Outer Limits, Twilight Zone, One Step Beyond, I mean, that was my education in uh, life after death and hauntings and evil spirits and uh, vampires and all that. I mean, we had a you know just a wonderful uh, uh, upbringing of that because it was just so uh, prevalent. And Twilight Zone was one of the best. TV series and with Rod Serling ever. So, you know, uh, uh, it was, you know, a lot of it was political. You know, I mean, they used, you know, the monster was actually communism or the monster was actually a totalitarian government. But still, you know, we learned from that and, uh, you know, learned our, uh, and I think we, a lot of us baby boomers gained the vocabulary of the paranormal through some of these TV programs. So I think that stuck with me. And, that probably was one thing that, um, you know, that really got into my head and, and stayed there. I mean, I just enjoyed that stuff. But as far as having personal experiences, you know, uh, I mean, um, uh, I really can't think of, um, of any, um, uh, again, I, I can think of one thing that happened, but I, I don't, um, share with people because, uh, you know, a lot of people just, I mean, people, uh, tend to discount, or think you're crazy, or think you need help or healing or whatever, and, and I don't. So I just don't talk about it. But a lot of the stuff, you know, I, uh, I think needs to be personal, and is, you know, and it's, it's things that I've experienced and that I'll deal with. But uh, I, I will say my piece through my books and my words and my, I guess, my podcast interviews. But you know, that's and that's okay. And I'm sure that your listeners will respect me for that. You know, there's some things that. I, I certainly want to talk about, and then there's others that, that I don't think I should talk about. So it's as simple as that, you know, and no attitude, no condescension, just, uh, that's just the way it is. So. Yeah, no, that that's, that's respectable. Um, you know, it's interesting because a lot, of, again, a lot of people won't share their experiences. Um, what I've found is really helpful is sometimes when others hear about experiences, then they feel kind of empowered to step forward and say, yeah, that happened with me too. Um, and, and you, in, you know, you, in your book, in, in coal, um, coal region hoodoo, you interview, uh, not just, you know, you don't talk about not just Ed and Lorraine Warren, but you, um, you were able to interview other personalities, right. And include them in your book. Um, what were some of those, those other people that you, uh, you chose to put in the, into this new book? Well, Fred Tracy was a guy from uh, Derry, New Hampshire, and I heard about him from my, my cousin, Jim, who was a, a medic, and Jim was living up there in uh, New Hampshire, and he introduced me to Fred Tracy, but Fred Tracy was aboard a uh, aircraft carrier that had a similar experiment as the Philadelphia Experiment, and... Uh, 
And during World War II, the uh, Germans had these bombs, and when the ships would go over uh, the bombs, these under, these uh, uh, bombs at the bottom of the uh, the ocean, the magnetic field would trigger the explosion, so that that bomb would explode the uh, would uh, explode the uh, ships. So uh, Great Britain figured out a way to degauss these ships. And gauss, the gaussing is a, uh, I guess, a term for the uh, magnetism, a way to measure it. And what they would do is they would wrap coils around the ship and electrify it, and that would sort of kill that magnetic current. So according to the, uh, uh, the Philadelphia experiment, uh, they did this. There was an experiment in Philadelphia where the ship was uh, teleported from Philadelphia to Virginia and then back. Uh, men died. Uh, men were fused in, t into the bulkhead, and uh, you know, and then there was a cover-up. Uh, Fred Tracy, the guy that I, that I interviewed, was involved in a similar ex experiment, and he had information, you know, from from uh, the higher ups that this actually happened. So I interviewed him, and I put that in in, in the book. But uh, the uh, there, I have an, uh, a chapter on the Philadelphia experiment, and this year I think it's going to be the 80th anniversary of the Philadelphia Experiment. And I've already had, uh, even though the book's only been out a week, I've already had people reach out to me to see if I'm going to do, be doing anything to commemorate the 80th anniversary of the, sh the uh, Philadelphia Experiment. So that's pretty amazing. I mean, again, the book only being uh, out a short amount of time and already, you know, people are, making, are, are reaching out. So it's... Uh... It's funny because you mentioned Deering, New Hampshire. Um... I've heard that there are a lot of Bigfoot reports out there, and that community is uh, no stranger to that particular cryptid. Um, what can you tell us about uh, the Bigfoot phenomenon, and did you look into that in your book? Yeah, I did. Actually, I got pretty excited about Bigfoot. Uh, uh, you know, thousands of people have seen pretty much the same thing. You know, huge apes, you know, eight to ten foot tall, long arms, uh, eyes that... Uh, that uh, don't reflect light, but they emit light. Uh, 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 they describe uh, the Bigfoot as gliding, not walking, either loping or gliding. They talk about the biolocation where uh, the, uh, the Bigfoot is in front of you, then it's behind you that they change. So there's a whole lot of things. So I uh, interviewed people like Tim Renner, who wrote Bigfoot in Pennsylvania, and, and he's pretty much a, uh, he doesn't like the word authority, but he is a Bigfoot authority. Um, and um, I have a chapter called the Bigfoot Hypothesis. So I talk about all these uh, uh, genres, all these categories that might, that you might be able to put Bigfoot into, you know, what exactly does Bigfoot represent? So again, I'll let your readers read that chapter to see what I'm talking about. But uh, I put two chapters uh, in my book about Bigfoot. And um, one of the reasons is because Pennsylvania is the, uh, the number three state as far as Bigfoot sightings after California and Washington. And a lot of these sightings are in uh, an area called the Chestnut Ridge. It's south of Pittsburgh. It's like a hundred mile stretch from Pittsburgh down to uh, West Virginia. Very remote and uh, not only are there uh, Bigfoot sightings there, but Bigfoot and UFO sightings together. So strange, high strangeness, you know, if there ever was, was any. So uh, Stan yeah. Gordon is sort of the guy out there, Stan's, Stan's the man, you know, as far as uh, yeah. Bigfoot and yeah. UFO out, out in Western Pennsylvania. So uh, I had a chance to uh, uh, meet Stan uh, last year. I went out to the... Uh, 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 Kecksburg uh, UFO Festival and meet him and uh, and then um, and which was really great. He's he's a great guy and uh, 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 sort of uh, documenting Bigfoot uh, almost uh, in a in a scientific uh, methodology. I mean, uh, just uh, very detailed uh, writings and, and documents. So he's doing a lot for the uh, the field of, uh, of Bigfoot uh, researchers. Yeah. Yeah, he, he's incredible. I've never had the um, the pleasure of meeting him in person. But uh, on that note, you know, can you explain like the difference between science and the supernatural, and and why can't they just like go together? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think that uh, 
science and the supernatural or the paranormal, you know, same term. I think they're, they're the same. And uh, the example that I tend to use is the apple. You know, you drop an apple and we see the apple falling. So that's the effect. And the cause is Newton's law of gravity. You know, the apple drops. It doesn't go up, so it drops. So we have cause and effect. That's, the, the, that's what we use within the scientific realm. Uh, but with the paranormal, we see things. We see lights and apparitions and things happen. We see them, but we don't have a scientific law like gravity to explain what this is. So I believe that a lot of the things that we have, a lot of this uh, paranormal uh, things, high strangeness, you know, are actually within the scientific realm. And maybe at one point we'll be able to understand uh, what, what that is, that what the cause is. And when we talk about UFOs, that's a really good example. Um, I was, uh, I was uh, in the Navy. I was, uh, I'm a Vietnam vet. I was aboard a, uh, an aircraft carrier. I was a radarman. We would see bogeys. These were tangible contacts that were faster and more maneuverable than any guided missile that, that, that than we had or the Soviet Union at the time had. So we would put them in the log book, you know, uh, UFOs, range and bearing, and we were told not to talk about it. Now, most of us guys, you know, we were kids fighting a war. We were all like, you know, 20 or younger. So um, just about three years ago, the Pentagon admitted that maybe 3% of the things that we see, that Navy pilots see, are unexplainable. And again, you have three choices. I mean, what are they? They're either ours, they're either Russian or, or, or Chinese or Iranian, or they're extraterrestrial. So take your pick, you know. Um, you know, we just don't know. We just don't know. Um, I kind of think that maybe it's that we're that it's stealth technology that that we've developed that we've been able to keep the lid on, but uh, but I, that's just my guess. But I really don't know. It's just uh, too many things happening, and uh, and uh, and now though when the military, especially the Navy pilots, report that they're documented, okay, and and they're and they're not covered up. So we know that we're seeing a lot of things. What we know too is that. UFOs are changing. I mean, the shape. They're either a tic-tac shape or an oblong shape or a triangular shape. I mean, the, the shape seems, seems to have changed. Uh, and again, the, uh, the, the qu question remains, what are they? So uh, a lot of people have, have addressed that. And, you know, we started off talking about uh, Heineck, his 1972 yeah. book, and he uh, was addressing that. And he had talked to hundreds and hundreds of people and uh, mm -hmm. investigated so much of this. And uh, you know, and, and he, right now I want to go back because you had mentioned that, you know, being in the Navy, um, my dad was in the Navy too, but he never, he never saw any, uh, strange anomalous objects in the sky. Uh, you, so you have, you're, yeah, you're saying absolutely. you have, well, we saw now again, they were called bogies. They were solid contacts on a radar scope. And, you know, you know, not uh, mass hallucinations, not ducks, not marsh gas, not a reflection from Venus. I mean, you know, the whole litany of excuses that we used to get, you know, in the 50s and 60s about UFO sightings. None of that. I mean, you know, this is technology that 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 works, that picks up solid con con contacts. And that's what they were fast and maneuverable. They were UFOs. Uh, you know, we we don't. That's what they were UFOs. I mean. Uh, nothing else. I mean, we just don't know who they belong to and, you know, none of that. But, yeah, we saw them. Now, um, whereabouts, do you remember or do you recall where these were seen? Like, um, and, like, how frequent were these bogeys picked up? Yeah, they were picked up frequently. Now, again, I was in the OI division, Operation in, uh, uh, Intelligence. And, you know, in all the movies, you see the status boards, you know, the war room. Well, that's where I worked. Uh, and, uh, you know, so we uh, we, we had uh, numerous uh, radar scopes and we saw UFOs, these bogeys all the time. Uh, we were told not to talk about them. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, again, they were they were uh, uh, they were for real. Um, you know, uh, I mean, I don't I don't know what else to say about it. All I uh, the, what's happening today, though, you know, just to, with the Pentagon is that finally, after all these decades, the government, the United States government is admitting that these things exist, you know, 
and not giving us that whole litany of things that they're hallucinations or, you know, that nonsense. So at least we're getting real. And part of this is because a lot of, there's been some presidents that have asked, you know, uh, information about UFOs. Um, you know, a lot of politicians have, have asked for information. So I think there's been some pressure on the government to at least be a little bit more candid than they had been, you know, in, in previous decades. So maybe, you know, I mean, for ufologists, the climate is a little bit, uh, has more clarity than it ever has. So this is sort of, a, you know, good news for, for, for us as, as researchers. Yeah. yeah, definitely. You know, are there aspects of what's going on now with the UFO topic that you can relate to, especially with the crewmen and the military personnel that were there on the ships seeing these things? Yeah, I I, ha, I still keep in touch with uh, some of my uh, my Navy buddies, and yeah, we talk about the same thing. And I mean, we saw them; we just don't know what they were. You know, it's the same the same thing. Um, uh, and and we talk about it not with a whole lot of emotion or uh, hysterics or any of that. Just that we we saw them, and I think you know, I think the the, the biggest emotion is like the curiosity, like what exactly did we see? You know, but yeah, but yeah, we. Uh, that, they, they were real. Have you ever thought about further pursuing that line of research in, you know, a future book, right? Where you look specifically at those UFO reports that you were present for and do some digging around, see what you can pull up. I, I don't know if I would do that. I think if I did a follow-up book to co-region Hoodoo, I think it would be one that would probably... Uh, go more into what I would call a spiritual realm. Uh, again, guardian angels, apparitions, miracles, um, uh, exorcism, uh, you know, uh, demonic possession, things like that. I mean, I, I, uh, there's something about that that, again, it speaks to me, it excites me, I'm really interested in it. And, um, you know, uh, I think that's probably the direction that I that I would go in, but you know, I'm okay. following. I mean, every time there's an article about UFOs, I, uh, I read it, you know, I'm a big fan of, uh, ancient, uh, aliens and watch, listen to that all the time, you know? And so, you know, and, and, you know, just to, uh, stay current and, uh, just amazing, um, you know, what's out there, you know, you know, when you talk about ancient uh, civilizations, I mean, just amazing what some of those people did thousands of years ago. Yeah. And there's some, there's some aspects in your book. I mean, your book is you, reading the little synopsis that you have on Amazon. It's very diverse, right? You, yeah. you cover a lot of ground with this. Yeah. And, um, you know, like, how are you able to kind of include so many of those diverse variables into that book and still remain somewhat cohesive in the general thesis of it? Like, what was the, what connects it all together? Yeah. Um, I think what connects it is that I take a, uh, a sociological look at the paranormal. I blend in some popular culture, some spirituality, and put it together in this, 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 this little box uh, uh, that takes place in Pennsylvania. And I call it the co-region hoodoo, but co-region is a metaphor for Pennsylvania, for the entire state. And I talk about Night of the Living Dead, the blob and uh, the Philadelphia experiment, you know, uh, motion pictures that were unique to Pennsylvania and what they represented. And for example, um, last summer we went out to Monroeville. We went to the Night of the Living Dead Museum, and then we went up to Evan City. And the uh, uh, the, the mayor Dean Zincon gave my wife and I a tour of the Evan City. A cemetery where Night of the Living Dead was shot, you know, released in 1968. You know, most people think that Night of the Living Dead is this zombie movie, you know, the undead come to life from an ancient, uh, a meteor, you know, uh, life force and all that. But um, it pretty much was a uh, sociological take about what was happening in the United States in 1968. Uh, the Tet Offensive, the assassination of uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert Kennedy, riots in the streets. I mean, just horrible, horrible things happening. There was almost a meltdown of our society. And uh, I start my book out with Night of the Living Dead and what it really represented. And so I have uh, a couple of, um, you know, chapters that take, take a look at that. 
that talk about fear as a motivator, why, you know, we are drawn or attracted to uh, monster movies, you know, horror movies, and, uh, and then look at some real life monsters. And so I think I mix it up and I think that, that and, and shake it up and what comes out, I think is a cohesive product. And again, we're just going to have to see what the readers say about this. You know, so it'll be interesting. I mean, I hope that they accept my direction and, uh, you know, and my version of the paranormal. Uh, mm -hmm. But and uh, but, you know, um, but it is comprehensive. And uh, and I'm really proud of this book. I mean, I, it's published by Beyond the Fray. They're a paranormal publishing group from San Diego. And all they do is paranormal themes, not fiction, not thrillers, just paranormal stuff. So. The publishing process with Beyond the Fray, you know, I, I hadn't heard of them. I had heard of um, Beyond the Fray as a, you know, a radio uh, offshoot, but I, I hadn't heard about the publishing aspect. It, like, how did you find them and what was it like working with, with that publishing yeah, yeah. company? First of all, I have to thank Tim Renner, uh, the Bigfoot guy, for telling me about that. I was looking for, uh, I was finishing my manuscript and I was looking for a publisher and, uh, you know, I wanted to get somebody who was more specific to the paranormal and somebody who would, who would help me with promotion. And so Tim Renner told me about Beyond the Fray. So I reached out to them and we negotiated a contract. And then over a three month period and for, the, for your fledgling aspiring writers out there, it took about three months to go from uh, proofreading, you know, accepting the manuscript, proofreading, formatting, working on the cover with a graphic designer over a three-day uh, period, and then finally getting it published. So it was about a little over th uh, three months. And uh, I did get uh, one book in hand, you know, that I uh, and uh, was really pleased with it. I mean, it looks good. It feels good. It's solid. And, uh, and you, you want something that you're going to be proud of and uh, something that is as error-free as is humanly possible, you know, I'm, you know, so, um, you know, I think that it's, it's relatively clean as far as, uh, you know, no typos and, you know, you know, just stupid, basic amateurish mistakes, but I think it reads well. And, uh, I did get an email from uh, a woman from New Mexico who, uh, was Googling UFOs and found the book and she's reading and she's emailing me like every other day and telling me that she likes, likes my writing style and, you know, making remarks about the book. It, I mean, it's wonderful because many times as an author, you don't get the feedback or it takes a while to get the feedback. Just like in the case of the Shepton book that I don't know how many years it took for that lady to say, hey, I read your book three times. You know, I mean, that's that's a pretty nice compliment. And uh, so, um, but anyway, uh, Beyond the Fray is the publisher and uh, they've been... Uh, very, uh, very good. They also have a podcast, and I don't know if it's called Beyond the Fray or Into the Fray, but uh, they're scheduling me for that, so we're going to be doing that. And uh, also, I'll, I, uh, I'll be on Coast to Coast, and uh, so you know, things are going to be are going to be happening. Great. Yeah, you know, when it's it's funny because you touched on writing the book, right? When you're working on a book. You know what? What does your daily routine consist of? Do you do you sit down and you just you know bang out a bunch of pages at once, or do you do you struggle with it? Like, do you run into those feelings of self doubt when you're working on a book? Like, how do you get past that? Yeah, uh, self doubt is a killer, and you can't allow self doubt to get into your head. I mean, you just can't. Um, uh, I uh, I get up in the morning and I meditate, and I just get into my my uh, my zone. Uh, give myself self affirmations, and if I need those throughout the day, if uh, you know I get the monkey mind, if uh, crazy things get into my head, I just get meditate again and just you know find my center. But uh, pretty much, I get up in the morning, meditate, and then I uh, uh, do some writing. I have little I call them cutouts, and I don't know where I got that term, but they're just pieces of articles or you know books that that I'm working on and so I'll work on those cutouts and they get larger and larger and you know I try to work on that every day and um uh and you know do some research I try to read uh you know paranormal things um you know and I like to keep up on Bigfoot UFOs you know just you know some of the current things um uh, uh 
and uh, and and so that's what I do. But I, I'm pretty structured with my with my writing, and uh, you know, and um, uh, I don't wait for inspiration to to strike. I try to write every day. And again, if uh, you have any fledgling authors out there, I mean, that's really the trick, just to write every day. Well, you know, you've you've been yeah. published numerous times, so you. So, what, how, is that how you do it? Yeah, you know, it's getting in that routine, getting in that good habit of just writing every day, reading something every day, and not just internet articles, like actually picking up something tangible. You know, there's a difference in how mm-hmm. those are written, how a book is written as opposed to an internet article, right, which is written for scanning. Um, yeah. And uh, and even writing internet articles, it's different than writing a book, right? There's a different uh, a technique, right, because – attention spans are extremely short, as you know, um, right. because you, you do presentations. Um, in addition to writing, you also deliver presentations, give right. talks. And I'm sure you've seen out there in the audience, there are people that will literally fall asleep on you. Exactly. Um, and it's like, how do you keep those people engaged? You know, especially when we're talking about such complex topics like this. Um, it's not really easy to explain these subjects. You know, it, it takes a certain level of understanding and, and you, as you're developing your books, you can see that also in your writing too, right? You're like going through a journey where you're processing a lot of this stuff. You're making sense of it and you're learning along the way. Like what, what did you learn when writing this particular book? Oh, absolutely. Well, you know, just terminology and definitions, you know, uh, high strangeness and close encounters of the third kind and things like that. I mean, there's all these layers and levels. And uh, I just think that my understanding of the paranormal just got wider. The scope got larger in writing the book and researching the book. And uh, it was just a great experience. And when it finally all came together, I mean, what, that was just such a wonderful feeling. Um, you know, and you talk about, you know, the the, the, the complexity or the amount of uh, topics, but your book, uh, The Spectrum, was sort of like that. I mean, you really were able to capture a whole lot of themes in one book. And I think it was, I really enjoyed your book. I mean, you just um, did, uh, you know, uh, you addressed so many different paranormal topics and uh, you know, um, you know, so uh, it's 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 nice to uh, to converse with a fellow uh, paranormal author, and um, you know, so um, I'm sure that you you had people that you know um, you know complimented you on you know just the amount of uh, topics that you included. Yeah, you know, it, it's so important to collaborate with other writers, other researchers, other investigators in the field, because we can learn a lot from each other. And I remember, you know, sometimes we just, we pick up the phone, right? And we just have these conversations where we're bouncing ideas back and forth. And as you were working on that book, you know, I could tell by the excitement in your voice, you know, when you, when you kind of had a quote unquote breakthrough, right? And you just, you hit that stride, that momentum, Mm -hmm. and it kind of carried you the rest of the way. Now on that token, and I kind of got into it or alluded to it a little bit earlier in this conversation, but I'm going to bring back to, to that again is when you, we're working on these topics, sometimes we kind of feel guided, right? And, you know, I've heard this from not just other writers, but um, experiencers where, for lack of a better descriptor, they kind of feel like they're downloading this information, and they have to like disseminate it out. Have you come across that, or that's or really a good this? way to be downloading, or I call it channeling. I mean, I think that sometimes that creativity just is channeled through me from I'm not sure where. I mean, take your pick. You know, I mean, some divine power, some you know, some higher power. I'm not sure, but. Um, when that happens, I mean, you can feel it and you are just so creative and you can see things on different levels and your perspective is just so much different. I and mean, you're able to clearly see that topic and write about it. And that's really what, what we try to do. We, we, you know, we try to articulate something that cannot be articulated. That's exactly what we do. It's certainly not articulated in scientific terms. So that's what we bring to the fore. And um, yeah, I, I believe that, that that's true. I believe that um, that uh, when I was writing the book that there were energies uh, that were channeled through me and uh, and saw me to the end. But uh, 
it, it was a great experience and a positive experience. I mean, I'm you know when it was getting closer to being you know to completion and uh, and and getting published was just a wonderful wonderful feeling of accomplishment. And uh, there was one moment of self doubt. And that was, um, I think, when the book was published, and I just had a just a, a little snippet of self doubt. What if they don't like it? What if the readers don't like mm. this book? What if it's not accepted? And I had to go and just get myself back on, on firm ground and find my center and get beyond that. You just you can't do that. You need to be, and I am positive and uh, you know and uh, and confident. But uh, as a human being. We have that. We have self doubt, and uh, you know, and and all the other dark emotions because we're humans. You know, we're not, you know, mm -hmm. we're not perfect. So whenever you know things like that happen, you find ways to, you know, to get out of it either by talking to people or by you know talking yourself out of it. So, yeah. so um, fortunately, you know, I was, um, you know, I didn't have, I wasn't really hampered by that uh, a whole lot. You know, but um, uh, another thing with literary people with writers i mean a lot of writers are very we're all sensitive individuals you know i mean and when uh, you know and it's hard to take the criticism and a lot of writers are suffer from depression a lot of writers are addicted to uh substances or alcohol and there's a whole long list of people like edgar Allan poe who uh, who suffered much for their craft john steinbeck i mean so many people so um you know, I mean, I'm, I don't think you and I are suffering for our craft, but we're enjoying yeah. it and celebrating it. But um, I can see, and you know, I know that s some writers do. So Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's really tough, and especially with this topic, because, you know, you, you get into some really dark territory. And, yeah. you know, like you touched on earlier, right? You, there are certain things that I think the listener, the audience who's tuning in this show need to keep in mind that when you get close enough to this topic, you have to know your limits, right? You have to know when to step back, when to take a break, so to speak. And has that ever happened to you when, when working with this? Uh, have you ever had that experience where, okay, I just need to take a step back. This is getting too much. Or do you just keep pressing on forward? Yeah, no, uh, sometimes I need to go and come up for air and get away from it and get recharged. Yeah. I mean, just, you could only take so much. And especially when you're talking about dark themes, uh, you know, so, um, you know, we try to keep that positivity in our head and all that, but, um, you know, um, but, you know, and, and it also as a writer, it's good to pace yourself to maybe spend an hour behind the computer and then get away, you know, and then maybe come back, but just, um, you know, don't wear yourself down. I mean, just be smart about it and be organized. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and that's, yeah, I think the, the, the best way to, uh, you know, to, to pursue this, you know, when you're working on a, on a manuscript. Yeah. And speaking of dark stuff, you know, it's in the title of your book, you know, you explain the coal region part, yeah. but the hoodoo part, where does that come from? Yeah. Well, that was pretty much, you know, there's a term down in Louisiana, you know, the, the, Bayou, the vo voodoo practitioners, and hoodoo is is basically a, a dark spell that uh, that people might uh, put a curse on on somebody else. Uh, and uh, I decided I wanted to use that for the coal region. I used that in somebody else's dream, and I used that term for the first time. But I just think it works, and I wanted to use it for the coal region. And I wanted to do for the Pennsylvania coal region what Stephen King did for the state of Maine. I wanted to go and talk about the paranormal aspects and celebrate them and write about them and get them front and center because nobody else is doing this in a scholarly way, in an academic way. And uh, I've uh, read some of these paranormal books and I'm just sort of appalled by some of them that just are not well written. And, you know, and I think that we can do better. We can do better, you know, as academics, you know, because we're, you know, we're still supposed to be teaching others. But um, um, yeah, um, uh, it's called Coal Region Hoodoo, and uh, it's about the, the Pennsylvania paranormal. And, um, and like I said, it's, uh, it's published by Beyond the Fray and uh, available on Amazon.
The full title, Coal Region Hoodoo, Paranormal Tales from Inside the Pit. And I just love that. You know, it, it grows on you, you yeah. know, after a while. And uh, that is available by Maxim Furick. And you can find it on Amazon, right? Is that Absolutely. where? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. yeah are, there any, are there any bookstores, like local bookstores in, in Pennsylvania that somebody can go to or that you would recommend that they might pop in, check it out or? Yeah, I haven't done any of that yet. You know, the books, uh, the book has been out, like I said, for about a week, a little over a week. And I've been setting up book signings and programs, you know, in down here in Florida. I'm in Florida currently. And also in, I'll be doing that in Pennsylvania. But I haven't uh, touched base with any bookstores. And uh, I think Barnes & Noble may be carrying the book. I know they carried somebody else's dream. But I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, I'm not you know, uh, really keyed in with that aspect of, of, uh, you know, of, of marketing and promoting. If somebody wants to get in touch with you and they have like a story to share with you, or they have some, you know, feedback to offer on, on your projects. Yeah. I know you have a website. Yeah. Yeah. It's www.maximfurek.com. That's M-A-X-I-M-F-U-R-E-K.com. W www.maximfury.com. So they could contact me. There's a, there's a way to contact me. Um, or if they wanted to provide feedback for Coal Region Hoodoo, they certainly could go and write a review on Amazon, good or bad. Doesn't matter. I mean, just I'd like to see what, you know, what's working and what isn't. So, um, you know, so, so that would be great too. Um, and, but, and you're on Facebook, you're on Instagram. Yeah, yeah I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And LinkedIn. And, uh, yeah. So if you want to get in touch with Maxim Furick, go to MaximFurick.com. That's M-A-X-I-M-F-U-R-E-K. That's MaximFurick.com. Or look him up on Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, you can check out all of his work, all of his various books, his various projects. And speaking of projects, do you have any other projects in the pipeline because, you know, everybody always asks that. You, you release one book, and then they're quick to say, when's the next one coming out? What can you tell us? Yeah, I'm working on one. I call it a tentative title. It's Dream Gliding, uh, Honoring the Wisdom of the Ancients. And it's sort of like a self-help book. But the premise is that, you know, there's nothing new under the sun, that everything that we hear today from uh, Eckhart Tolle and Deepak Chopra and Anthony Robbins has been articulated 2,000 years ago by Jesus Christ and Buddha and Muhammad. So there's nothing new under the sun. You know, guys like me and you were have, might have been having this similar conversation 2,000 years ago, you know, only not over the Internet. But um, things pretty much don't change. Human behavior doesn't change. So I uh, wanted to put together a, a book going deep and uh it's it's slow going because it's just like very uh cerebral stuff and it's just like uh and that's something you asked about the dark stuff you know getting away from the computer well this is stuff i have to get away from the computer because it's just like overwhelming and uh you know i need i need a break from that but um uh it's coming along nicely and um uh, and we'll see what happens but it's just uh it's just a side project that i've been working on and having fun with and uh you know, looking at, uh, you know, some uh, aspects of uh, uh, wisdom that's been with us for, for, for thousands of years. Awesome. That's great. And you're doing speaking events, you're doing presentations. Do you have any lined up or when, where can somebody go to find out where you're going to speak next? Yeah, uh, they should. And I need to update my, um, uh, my website. I'll, I'll do that tonight, but, um, uh, www.maximfurick.com. I'll be uh, doing presentations back in uh, Pennsylvania in May and also in June. And, um, you know, and uh, I'll uh, be putting that on Facebook and also some of the paranormal sites. And but also I'll make sure that I update my uh, my uh, my uh, website. Well, that's that's great. Well, there you have it. Uh, Coal Region Hoodoo, Paranormal Tales from Inside the Pit by Maxim Furick. He was our guest today. I highly encourage you to check out his work. Look on Amazon. Request it from your local bookstore if they don't have it. And visit his website. He's got a lot of great stuff there. And he's going to be posting more stuff there from what you heard now. Um, so we're looking forward to it, my friend. And thank you for, uh, 
for coming on the show and, uh, and discussing some of your projects with us. Yeah. And thanks for having me, Justin, and good luck with your podcast. I think it's going to be uh, uh, really successful. I think, you know, I think it's, uh, it's going to be a great show and uh, you're the right personality for it. So uh, good luck and uh, I'll be, I'll be listening. So. Well, thank you, my friend. I, I appreciate that.